In this video, I'm going to be talking about how we can replace envy with contentment and love. Let's get into it. Ever since I was young, I've always thought that languages were pretty cool. Not necessarily learning them, because I was just never really a great student, but learning about how they work and where they came from, I always thought that was pretty fun. And one of my favorite languages is actually a variation of English. It's called Shakespearean English. And the reason it's my favorite is because no matter what you're saying, it just hits a little bit harder. So when you say something stupid, it sounds even funnier. But when you say something serious, I feel like it has so much more weight behind it. So I want to open our message this week with a quote from Shakespeare's play, Othello. It says, Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. It just hits so much harder. As you may have guessed, I want to talk about jealousy and envy today. Have you ever felt envious of a friend, a sibling, someone on social media, or just someone famous? I think at one point or another, we've all been envious of someone. Before we continue, I want to clear, get clear what I mean when I say envy. Today, we're not defining envy as looking at someone's cool new shoes and thinking, those are cool shoes, it would be nice to have a pair. When we talk about envy today, we'll be talking about what happens when you stop simply wanting or wishing for something and you let it turn into something ugly, like frustration, anger, self-pity, or hatred. We've all had a moment, or maybe a few moments, when we've been a little envious of someone. It's easy to make excuses for envy. We might think, I'm not jealous, they're just a jerk. Or, I'm not being judgmental, they just really aren't that talented. Or, you know, I, th I think I deserve what they have a lot more than they do. Whether we wish we had someone's position on a team, their relationships, their shoes, their perfect family, or their full ride scholarship, it's easy for envy to creep in, take over, and cancel our joy, contentment, and self-worth. It usually starts small, but envy can easily grow into a monster. Here's how scripture talks about envy. In Proverbs 27.4, it says, Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Think back to the last time you were absolutely furious at someone. Do you remember how you felt in that moment? Do you still feel that way now? I would guess not, unless it was really, really recent. Anger is a big emotion but it comes and goes. Jealousy, on the other hand, keeps growing and growing, and as it grows, it begins to harm us in our relationships with others. In the Bible, we find a story about a time when envy slowly destroyed a man named Saul. Saul was the king of Israel, but he had a problem. Because Saul had failed to be a good king, God chose a young shepherd boy named David to replace him, to be the next king of Israel. And when Saul first encountered David, he was actually kind of impressed. He didn't know that David was to be the next king. David just played music for him and brought peace to the king when it sounded like nothing else could. So how does this relationship that Saul and David have, where Saul is appreciative and impressed by David, go to one where I need to talk about it when we're talking about envy? Well, let me show you. See, right here, I've got a water bottle. It's fresh, not even opened yet. And in my other hand, I've got some green food dye. Now, what I'm gonna do is just summarize the story of King David and King Saul's life. So, as I mentioned before, David shows up and he plays music for Saul and it brings Saul peace. A little while down the line, the army of Israel and the army of Philistine are fighting each other. And it comes out that a man from Philistine comes out and he says, whoever can beat me one-on-one -on -one, Send him my way. Let us fight as champions for our people. If I win, you and the other Israelites will be slaves. But if you win, we will be your slaves. And all of the men there are terrified because this guy is huge. And after a couple of days of this, David shows up on the battlefield and he sees this guy come out and he says, why is no one doing anything about this? Aren't we, are we going to just let him talk like this? 
And so David says, I'll go myself. And Saul says, no, 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 no. You're too young. And David says, no, I'm going. And Saul says, well, at least take my armor and my shield and my sword. And David says, this is too heavy. I'm 16. I can't carry this into battle. I can't fight like this. And so David goes out with nothing but a sling and a few rocks. I think we all know how the story of David and Goliath ends. Goliath gets a rock to the helmet, falls down, and doesn't get back up. But I want to look at it from Saul's perspective. This kid just showed up and took down a guy twice his size, whose armor probably weighed more than David did. And he's just doing it nonchalantly. He just shows up and he's like, I'll do it because no one else will. I want to... I wonder what Saul was thinking there. I wonder what the other soldiers of Israel were thinking there. It probably was, who does this kid think he is? But then they see him do it, and they all start celebrating, right? But I imagine Saul, this leader of this army, looks at him and says, how come I couldn't do that? So he gets a little bit jealous. So we add just a little bit of this green food coloring here. And as it goes, it'll start to, I mean, as it goes, it starts to turn a little green, right? Still mostly clear, though. You can see a little bit of green coming through. We got some green there at the bottom, but it's, it's still all right. But as the relationship continues, as David grows up, he joins the army. He rises through the ranks to become a commander in Saul's army and eventually leads many successful missions. So much so that at one point, as they return from war, they come into the city, and the people see Saul, and they say, Saul has killed thousands of Philistines. And Saul probably stands up a little bit. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a pretty great soldier, huh? I'm a pretty great kid. But then David walks in, and they say, but David, David has killed tens of thousands. And Saul gets that, another little hit of that jealousy, right? He says, how can they love him so much? I'm their king. So he gets a little bit more green at it. A little bit more green. And as he continues, as this relationship continues, he sees David every day. Sees this relationship. He sees David become best friends with his son, Jonathan. And as it continues, he gets more and more green to the point that that friendship, that love for David isn't there anymore. It's jealousy. So much so that at one point, one day, they're sitting in court. David is playing his instrument for Saul, bringing him peace. And Saul just can't find peace. He sits there, he looks at David, and he says, This guy, he's taking the love of my people. He's taking the respect of my soldiers from me. I can't let that stand. I hate him. And he takes a spear in his hand, and he launches it at David, trying to kill him. And David barely dodges it. Now, that took a bit of a turn there toward the end, right? Like, Saul wasn't interested in celebrating David or recognizing his achievements. He just wanted him gone. Saul's jealousy was so great that he decided to cancel David once and for all, with a spear. Saul's first attempt to kill David may have failed, but he was really excited to try again. So after David escaped, he ran as far as he could from Saul. But Saul kept chasing him. He hunted David from city to city, his envy so great that Saul was ready to do anything in order to see David dead. But some surprising things happened during that pursuit. First, David had a chance to kill Saul, but he didn't do it. Then, a little while later, David has a second chance to kill Saul. And again, he doesn't take it. Instead, he comes up to the king and he says, hey, you know, I've had two opportunities now to kill you, and I haven't. Why do you hate me so much? And eventually, they have a conversation, and they decide, Saul decides to stop trying to kill David. And I wish I could tell you that Saul totally turned his life around and chose to love David instead of jealously hating him, but I can't. I mean, he stopped trying to kill David, so I guess that's a win. But it doesn't appear that Saul ever stopped hating him. Not every story in the Bible has a happy ending, or even a clear lesson or practical takeaway. But here's what we can do with stories like Saul's. Reflect on his life and his choices. Look at where he went and what he did. 
Consider how his actions line up with what we know about God. And look to the words of Jesus. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 39 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you're not sure what to do, come back to these words from Jesus. Whether we're feeling the first hints of envy or we're so jealous that we're ready to throw a spear at someone, hopefully you never get to that point, but Jesus' words can always guide us. Love the people you envy. So in this story about Saul and David, who do you relate to? Are you like David? Do you feel like someone or a group of people are always out to get you because they're jealous of you? Do you feel alone, confused, or like you've been canceled? Or maybe you feel more like Saul. You've never thrown a spear at someone, hopefully. But is there someone that you thought about while hearing Saul's story? Someone you really dislike because if you're being honest, you're at least a little bit jealous of them? I feel like most of us are like both though. Chances are you have things in common with both Saul and David. I do. No matter how you relate to David and Saul, I think we can all agree that envy destroys those relationships because you can't love and let envy grow at the same time. But how do we stop being envious? It starts by finding contentment, fulfillment, and peace in the God who made us. Do you ever find yourself wanting, obsessing over, or comparing what someone else has to what you have? Are you envious of someone? What do they have that you want? Would having that thing make you content in your life? Would it really bring all that happiness that you think it will? Is Jesus your source of contentment? If not, I would encourage you to ask him to change your heart so that he is. If we want to replace envy with love, this is where we start. When our contentment is found in Jesus, it becomes so much easier to love others, including those who have things that we wish we had. But getting our hearts right is one of the first steps in replacing envy with love. If we really want to love the people we envy, we have to do something more. Instead of envying people who have something we want, what if we decided to celebrate them instead? Instead of imitating the call-out culture of the world around us, what if we chose to call out others' greatness? And one more idea. When we are the people who are being envied, instead of keeping all of our good things to ourselves, what if we decided to share the things that we have? Let's start practicing this right now. Let's start changing our culture for the better by celebrating each other, by calling out the greatness we see in others and thinking of ways we can share what we have. So that's my challenge for you guys this week and in the coming weeks. Celebrate the people who have what you want. Call out the greatness that you see in others. And when we have something great, let's share it with other people. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've created us all, that you provide everything that we need. You provide everything that we've been given. We, we thank you that we can find contentment in you in the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection. We can find contentment in your love for us. And I pray that you would help us to see that, that you would help us find that contentment so that when we see others having things that are different than what we have, when we see people showing greatness that we don't show, when we see people having possessions that we wish we could have, instead of being envious, instead of hating them, help us to love them. Help us to celebrate the greatness that they show. Help us to enjoy the things that they have. And help us, when we have the thing that someone else wants, help us to share it with them. Help us to live into those two commandments that you gave us, to love you with all our hearts, our, all our minds, and with all our strength, and to love each other as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.